All right, guys, welcome to our review test uh, two study guide here. I'll be going through the even ones. Those are the ones you guys are required to do. The odds are included uh, as extra practice if you're interested with the uh, answers included at the end. All right, so let's take a look at our first problem here. It's asking us to use implicit differentiation to find the derivative in terms of x and y. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to do is going to set it up like this. This is how you begin whenever you do a uh, implicit derivative. Um, something you'll want to keep in mind is this is actually in parentheses here. So we have a chain rule that we're going to be applying here. The outside function is a sine function. And the inside function is the y cubed function there. And so when we take the derivative of that, we're going to take the derivative of sine, which is cosine, leaving the inside the same. Multiply that by the derivative of the inside, which is 3y squared. But don't forget that whenever you take the derivative of a y expression, you get a y prime when you're doing implicit differentiation. So that's the first derivative that we took there because of that guy. Now we're going to take the derivative of the rest. That's going to be 8x, and that's just 0. Now I want to get the y prime by itself, so all I need to do is divide the rest of this stuff over to the other side. And now I have y prime is equal to 8x over uh, 3y squared cosine of y cubed. And that would be our final answer there. So basically, just take the derivative, don't forget your y prime, and get the y prime by itself. Okay, um, let's go ahead and take a look at number four here. Number four, we have a slope field and we need to match it to a differential equation. Um, if you guys take a look back at your notes in lesson uh, 2.14, you'll see this little table here. And it's uh, some information just kind of shows you how you can match differential equations to slope fields. Um, you want to look and see, I would say the first thing you want to look for is um, this stuff. If the slopes are the same vertically or horizontally, that tells you if it has just an x or a y. The next thing you want to look at is where the zero slopes are located or where the undefined slopes are located. After that, you could just start looking at some specific points to determine where it's positive or negative. So let's do that. So I'm noticing here that for this particular problem, I've got some parallel slopes in every row, which means that the x does not seem to be affecting the answer, and therefore we would want to pick one that doesn't have an x. So we know that it can't be a, but it could be any one of these other ones. Notice that we do not have the same slopes, however, in the columns. So for instance here, the slopes are not the same. Therefore, my answer has to have a y in it, and that would rule out these other options here because they don't have any y's in them. So uh, that leaves me with this answer here. Um, so if that's not enough to identify the correct answer, you can also just look at where your zero slopes are located. Um, you'll notice here that all these slopes are flat, and that's because at each one of these points, the y value equals zero, and therefore the slope would equal zero because the slope is equal to the y value. Um, and if that still isn't enough, um, I would say just start picking some random points and plugging them in, see if they give you positives or negatives and whether those answers match the slopes that you see. But going in that order, I think, is best, looking at rows and columns, then looking at zeros, and then looking at specific points. All right, let's move on to number six. For each problem, find the equation of the line tangent to the function, and we want it in slope-intercept form. That means they want us to write it like this. So they actually do want us to simplify it, which usually when I've done these, I haven't required it. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, so to do a tangent line, you need a couple things. You need an x, you need a y, and you need a slope. Now they've already given us the x and the y. Those are right there. My x is negative 3. My y is negative e. Um, <clears throat> now to find our slope, we need to find the derivative of this function. We can take the derivative of an e function. First of all, this, this constant in the front is going to stay the same. It's still going to have a negative 1 in the front. And we take the derivative of an e function. Uh, the e part just stays exactly the same. 
but we do need to multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which is the exponent part. And the derivative of that inside part is just negative 1. The, the negative 2 goes away, but the derivative of negative x is negative 1. So now I'm going to multiply this by negative 1. And this negative will cancel out this negative in the front, leaving me with a positive e to the negative x minus 2. There's my slope. Now I need to plug in the x value that they give me, which is negative 3. So if I were to plug in a negative 3 here, let's see what we get. Well, the double negatives become a positive, right? And 3 minus 2 is 1. So that means that y prime is equal to just e to the first power, which I can just write e. So I've got enough information to write my formula now. We have this is the formula that we use when we're trying to find the equation of a tangent line. And my slope, we just found, is e. The x value, we just found, is negative 3. And the y value is negative e. So we'll go ahead and simplify this. Um, this is going to become a positive. And so we have ex plus 3e minus e. And 3e minus e, we can actually simplify that. 3e minus 1e is 2e. So we have uh, that as our final answer. Kind of a weird looking tangent line, but same process. Let's go ahead and take a look at number 8. They want us to find the slope of this function at this given point. Um, actually, that's the same exact problem that we just had on number 6. So we find our derivative, which if you don't know how we got that, on the last problem, we, we do the derivative of the e function, which just stays the same, multiplied by the derivative of the inside, which is this exponent. And now we multiply those together. And then they want us to plug in the x value. That goes to positive 3. Positive 3 take away 2 is 1. So we end up with y of prime is equal to negative e to the first power. And that's our slope at that given point. Let's go ahead and take a look at number 10. This question is asking us where are the, find all the points where the tangent line to the function is horizontal. Okay, so if my tangent line is horizontal, that means that my slope equals 0. So in other words, I want to find this derivative These simplify here. That's my derivative. And the derivative tells you what the slope is, so that means that my derivative has to equal 0. So you just set that equal to 0 and you solve. And it turns out that that gives me x equals negative 3. So we find the derivative, we set it equal to 0 and solve, and that tells me at what value of x that this tangent line would have a slope of 0. Okay? Let's go ahead and take a look at number 12. This one's asking me to find the derivative, and as you can see, we have two functions being multiplied together. So when you want to find the derivative of a situation like that, we want to use the product rule. So, product rule looks something like this. <clears throat> I'll call this A, I'll call this B. And there's our product rule. So, A prime is 5x to the fourth plus 8x. B is 2x to the fourth minus 1. A is x to the fifth plus 4x squared minus 5. And B prime is 8x cubed. And just as you guys may recall, um, these could be in reversed order. These could be in reversed order. And actually this chunk and this chunk could be in reversed order as well. So the point is, so long as this one is with this one, and this one is with this one, 
it doesn't really matter what order they're in beyond that. Okay, um, I'm not going to require you guys to simplify it, so you can leave it like that. Let's go ahead and move on to number 14. Uh, here we're being asked to find the derivative. Now this is a quotient function. Um, now notice that this one is in simplified form. Um, so we are going to have to simplify these. Uh, here we go. So for quotients, we do the quotient rule, which is low d high minus high d low. Draw a line and square below. Oops, I miswrote something there. All right, so <clears throat> this here is going to require us to do some multiplication of polynomials, which maybe you learned it with a box method, maybe you learned it with a FOIL method. Um, not sure what you prefer, but. Um, I'll show my work, I suppose, here. Um, I use, I'll use i use the box method, but if you just want to do classic uh, FOIL method, that's fine as well. 2x to the 5th plus 4. 5x to the 4th plus 12x cubed. And then we just fill in the box by multiplication. Okay, so we have our, our answer there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and erase all that then, and I'm going to put our answer in its place. So we have 10x to the ninth, and then we have 24x to the eighth, uh, 20x to the fourth, and then finally 48x cubed. We also need to multiply this. Now this one's just a simple distribution method. So let's go ahead and do that. And then as you can see, we need to distribute this negative into the parentheses here. And then we can combine some like terms. So as you guys notice here, the 10x to the 9th and the negative 10x to the 9th cancel each other out. Um, we have a 24x to the 8th power minus a 38. Uh, 30x to the 8th power, so if we subtract those, we'll get the following. Now, I still don't see <clears throat> any of these answers up here, so matching this. Um, and I can tell by comparing the denominator to these that they must have foiled this out on the bottom also. So you have to understand that square there, that, that actually means that we have it written twice, right? And so that's another box method problem or FOIL method problem, if you will. So you could do the box and FOIL method on that if you want to. But if you did, you would end up with the following. And we would get this. Now, I still don't see any of these answers up here, um, but that's because we can reduce this. As you may notice here, all of these numbers can be divided by 2. And if you divide them all by 2, you would actually get this answer right here. So it was a reducing situation there. Um, but that takes care of that one. So you may have to reduce. Keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and move on to number 16. We want to find the derivative of this function here. Uh, first thing I would recommend is <clears throat> just rewriting it as 5x plus 2 to the 1 -fifth power. And then after that, we'll begin to do our derivative. It's a power rule, so you're going to move the 1 -fifth to the front, and we're going to take 1 off of the power, which would be negative 4 fifths. Um, we also need to multiply by the derivative of the inside, however, which is 5. It's a chain rule once again. And 5 times 1 -fifth, basically, those just cancel each other out, and I'm left with 5x plus 2 to the negative 4 fifths power. 
as you guys hopefully recall, a negative exponent simply moves the expression into the denominator, and then it becomes positive after that. And let's see which one of those answers seem good. It looks like option C would be correct there. All right, let's go ahead and move on to 18. So if I want to find um, this, we're going to use this formula up here. So that would be equal to 1 over f prime of f inverse of 9. Now, I can't promise you that I'm going to give you that formula on the, the test there, so I would pretend it's not there and just have that memorized. Um, but anyway, here we go. So we need to find this. So after you have your formula set up, that's step one, you want to figure out what is f inverse of 9. So what is f inverse of 9? Well, f inverse of 9 is the same thing as asking us f of what equals 9, because that's what inverses are. It's where the inputs and outputs are swapped from the original function f. Um, and according to our directions here, the answer is 1. So this part in the circle here is 1. The next thing we do is we need to just find, take our function here, find the derivative, and plug in 1. So f prime is 12x squared plus 1. And then when we plug in 1, I get 12 plus 1, which is 13. And so this thing comes out to be 1 over 13, and the answer would be C there. Let's go ahead and move on to number 20. Got some um, arc trig derivatives to remember here. Uh, the rule for arc sine, um, if you guys want to go back to your 1.8 notes, the derivative of arc sine is this particular formula. So, once again, that's in your 1.8 notes if you're interested. So, knowing all that then, let's get back to our problem here. It's going to be a chain rule though. We have the inside piece here is x to the fourth. So the derivative of the outside, which is the arc sine, is going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever on, is on the inside squared. And the inside is x to the fourth. And then we're going to multiply that by the derivative of the inside, which is 4x cubed. So putting that 4x cubed on the top and then squaring those parentheses down there in the bottom, we end up with that. And so the answer, as you can see there, is A. Number 22, um, they want us to find the second derivative of this particular function. And all that means is you just take the derivative twice. So um, you take the derivative once and you get negative 25x to the fourth plus 8x cubed plus 1. Just doing the basic power rule. Taking the derivative a second time, we get negative 100x to the third plus 24x squared using the power rule once again on that one. And that would be our final answer there. Let's go ahead and take a look at number 24. Got a definite integral here. And it's going to have some u substitution. So here's the, here's the u. The u is typically the inside part. Um, so after you find your u, you find the derivative of that with respect to the variable in the equation. In this case, it's x. And that would be the derivative of which is 2x. Getting the dx by itself, we multiply both sides by dx first. And then divide both sides by 2x after that. And that gets the dx by itself. So now I know that u is equal to this. And I know that dx is equal to this. So I can just replace each of those things in this little integral here. I can replace the x squared plus 3 with u, and I can replace the dx with du over 2x, and the x's go away, and 2 goes into 4 twice. So I have a negative 2, which we can take out to the front. Simplified, it would look like this. Now, we also need to change our limits, though. We don't leave those the same. And to change them, you just plug them into the u equation. So uh, if x equals 3, I could plug in 3 here for x, 
and then that will tell me what u is. So plugging in 3 here, I get 3 squared, which is 9, plus 3 is 12. So the top number becomes 12. Same thing with the bottom number, the 0. I could plug that in here. 0 squared is 0, plus 3 is 3. So my new bottom number is 3. So that's the u substitution part of the process. And the rest of it is basic integration. So the first thing I would do is I would move that u squared up into the numerator with a negative power. And then we would do the power rule for integration, which is where you add 1 to the power. And then you divide by that value. And we don't want to forget our negative 2 in the front and also these two limits of integration here. Um, we don't like having negative exponents, so um, I'm going to go ahead and simplify this a little bit. First of all, um, the, the u to the negative 1 is going to go down to the bottom. There it has a positive 1 power, but we don't really need to write the 1. Um, and then this 1 here and this 2, we can put those together. Um, the negatives will cancel, and the 2 just goes in the top. So that looks a little bit more clean that way. Um, from there, we could do our fundamental theorem of calculus, which is where you do your little setup here. You plug in the top number first and the bottom number last. So I've got uh, 2 over 12 minus 2 over 3. And I want a common denominator, so I'm going to multiply this fraction by 4 over 4. And that gives me negative 6 over 12, which is negative 1 half. And that would be my final answer. All right. Number 26. Let's go ahead and see what we can do here. Um, there's no u substitution needed here. There's no inside function, so we can skip that. It's also a different kind of problem. Um, we know what it equals, but we're missing the limit. You know, on the, on the last problem, we had the limits, and we had to find out what it equals. On this one, it's, it's different, uh, but a lot of the process is going to be the same. We're still going to integrate it by using the power rule, so we're going to add 1 to the power. If you add 1 to a negative half, you get a positive half, and you could divide by a half. I think that would be confusing. We've talked in the past about how instead of dividing by a fraction, you multiply by its reciprocal, 2 over 1, but there's no point in putting an over 1 there, right? So we'll just multiply it by 2. So there's my integral, and then we have our limits here, and that still equals 8, right? Um, then we do the fundamental theorem of calculus, where you separate those, plug in the k in one spot, and then plug in the 0 in your other spot. Now, uh, this whole thing is just going to be 0, because you're multiplying by 0, so we can ignore that, and now I've got 2k to the 1 half power equals 8. So I would divide both sides by 2 first if I wanted to solve for k, which is my goal. It gives me 4. And then I want to solve for k. Now how do I do that? Well, just raise both sides to the opposite or the reciprocal power, because that way those cancel and you get k by itself. And now I've got 4 squared, which is 16, is my final answer there. And that'll do it. All right, for numbers 27 and 28, we're going to use these graphs here. We've got f of x and g of x. Uh, for number 28, um, it says, given that j of x is equal to this crazy-looking thing, we want to find j prime of 6. So the first thing we want to do is, is we want to take the derivative of j. Now, it's going to be a quotient rule, low d high minus high d low, draw a line, square below. So the bottom's already being squared there. And so if I square it again, it's going to end up being a fourth power, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so we do low d high. minus high
d low. Now the derivative of the bottom is going to be a little tricky. It's a uh, chain rule. Um, the outside function there is the square. The inside function is the g. So the derivative of the outside will be 2 multiplied to the front, the power multiplied to the front, right? And then you take 1 off of the power, so now it's just g of x to the first power, times the derivative of the inside, which is g itself, so it's just going to be g prime of x. So that's the derivative of the bottom there. All right. Um, at this point, I would say you probably just want to go through and start plugging in the numbers that they've given you. So we're plugging in negative 6. So I'm just going to go through here and replace all these x's with negative 6. All right, so I've plugged in 6 in all the places, <coughs> negative 6 that is, in all the places where there was an x. Now we got to figure these things out. So what I want you guys to understand is that, uh, before we begin doing this, that g of x represents a y value, whereas g prime of x represents a slope. Same thing with the f function. f of x represents a y value, and f prime of x represents a slope value. So let's begin here. First thing it says here is we want to find g of negative 6. So in other words, they want to know what's the y value on the g function at negative 6, and that would be right up here. And that y value is 4. So it's being squared but we'll get to that in a minute. So for now, I'm just going to replace that with a 4. And I'll make this look a little more obvious because it is being squared. All right, next we want to find f prime of negative 6. So on the f graph, I want to look for f prime, which is the slope at negative 6. So at negative 6, that would be right here. The slope of this line um, is over 2 and up 1. It doesn't matter what two points you pick on this line. Just pick any two points and do the rise and the run, and you'll see what they are. Going to the right is positive, and going up is positive, so my slope is positive 1 over positive 2, which is a half. So you can also just do the old slope formula if you want to, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, but I just prefer to look at the graph and count the spaces to find my slopes. Uh, with the counting method, though, you have to be careful. Remember, left or down or negative, whereas right and up are positive. If you do it correctly, though, you should get the same answer either way. All right, moving on to the next one. We want f of negative 6. Now, that's a y value at negative 6. So the y value of this point is negative 3. So I'm going to replace this with negative 3. And then 2 times negative 6, we could just simplify that. There's no graph work we have to do there. 2 times negative 6 is simply 12, positive 12, that is. All right, continuing onwards. Uh, g of negative 6, so they want the y value of the g function at negative 6. The y value there is 4, so I'm going to replace this with a 4. And then finally, g prime of negative 6. That's the slope of this function at negative 6. And the rise and run is down 1 over 1. So that's a negative 1 slope. So I'm just going to replace that with negative 1. <clears throat> On the bottom, g of negative 6. We've already figured that out earlier. That was 4. And there we go. So from here on out, we really just need to simplify all this stuff. Uh, 4 squared is 16. And then we have, um, you know, instead of subtracting these and just getting a fraction, I'm just going to go ahead and distribute this. Because if you multiply those by 16, the, the fractions are going to go away. So 16 times a half is 8, and 16 times negative 2 is... Uh, negative 32. So I'm just going to go and replace those with 8 minus 32.
All right. Uh, negative 3 and 12 makes 9. Uh, 2 times 4 times negative 1, that's going to be negative 8. So I just erase all that and replace it with a negative 8. So I've got 8 minus 32, um, and that's going to be negative 24. And then I've got negative 9 and negative 8 being put together to make 72. And then the bottom here, I've got 4 squared squared, which is 256. Uh, putting these together now, what is negative 24 plus 72? And then, of course, we'll want to reduce that. Um, I believe 16 goes into both of those numbers. 16 goes into the top three times, and it goes in the bottom 16 times. So there's our final answer there. Um, so just to review, basically, you need to find your derivative. I used the quotient rule. Um, so on your test, you could expect to see either a quotient rule or a chain rule. I'm sorry, a quotient rule or a product rule. And within that, you can expect to see a chain rule as well, like there was a chain rule included here in the denominator. So you have to know how to do your derivatives. Second of all, whenever you're plugging in your number, you have to know how to tell if you're looking at a y value or a slope. Okay. Uh, beyond that, it's just a matter of plugging in numbers and simplifying. So let's go ahead and take a look at number 30, our last problem here. All right, we've got a product rule here. So I've got... <clears throat> Well, this should say k, actually. Let me fix that. Um, it says, if k of x is equal to a of x times b of x, find k prime of 3. Um, so the first thing that we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, do the derivative, which is the product rule, as I've said. It's going to be a, b, a, b, prime here, prime there. So we have a prime of x going here, we have b of x going here, a of x going here, and b prime of x going here. And then next we're going to plug in the 3. So let's go and replace all of our x's now with 3. And after that we're really just going to go through and use the table to fill in the values and simplify from there. So <clears throat> a prime of 3, so here's 3 and a prime is at that point 2. So that's going to be 2 times b of 3. b of 3 is 3. a of 3 is 2 and b prime of 3 is 4. So I've got 2 times 3 which is 6 plus 2 times 4 which is 8 and 6 plus 8 is 14, and that would be our final answer there. All right, and that does it for our study guide. So I've included the odd ones here as extra practice for you guys, and you can look at the answer key to see how you do on those if you want to. All right, we'll see you guys in class.